Good morning. Welcome to this Lord's Day in the Lord's house. A few announcements that we make before we get started, before we're called to worship. Uh, just to remind you, things going on this week at Woodruff Road. We will have our Wednesday night prayer meeting. Uh, we're back on, so we're excited to uh, get back together and enjoy a meal together and fellowship as well as instruction from the Word for all ages. Uh, Men at the Gates is still off for them. Just a reminder, we're still off for the month of June. Uh, so men, just hang in there. In July, we'll start up again. Uh, so uh, we'll let you know when that's happening. Ladies, coffee chat, mommy and me, solo sisters, are various things for the ladies coming up. Uh, I encourage you to look at your bulletin and see uh, when the dates are for those. Also, there's a ladies book club coming up on July 8th in which you're going to discuss the book by Rosaria Butterfield, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age, uh, led by Carrie Anderson. There's a sign up in the narthex and you can uh, pick up the book and read it. If you haven't read it and you don't get to it, you're still welcome to come and enjoy that time of fellowship and instruction as Carrie leads that. As I said, there's a sign up in the narthex and you can ask more questions about that as well. Uh, again, just remind you that there are all the upcoming events are listed in your bulletin and so you can um, begin to take that home and mark up your calendar uh, ahead of time so that you're well advised uh, before that. A visitor's class, if you're visiting with us, we are glad you're here. And we'd ask you to take out that blue card in the pew rack in front of you and fill that out. Put it in the offering plate or just hand it to us afterwards so we greet you personally. I'll remind you that we have a, do we have a visitor's class, an intro class uh, that meets regularly, although this will be the last one in the series until the end of July. July we'll have our J-term classes. We'll tell you more about that as it gets nearer. Uh, but this will be the last class for the intro class. Uh, until the end of July. So this is our, our famous, I say famous, Carl made it famous, uh, what we're not class. This is what, one of our favorites to, to say, um, this is the kind of church that we're not. And so we have a lot of people coming in and saying, are you this kind of church or that kind of church? We've made a list of 25 to 30 things to say, no, we're not that, no, we're not that. We'll list them out for you. So you have a pretty good idea from a negative definition of what we are. I want to remind you that we will be serving the Lord's Supper this morning. So uh, even now, as we prepare for worship, we encourage you to prepare your heart to receive the Lord's Supper. I'd like to prepare us for worship by reading two passages from Scripture. First is Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Then Romans 11, 34 to 36. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. The truths we will learn from the scripture today are those that are revealed to us by an omniscient God. His word is not a recapitulation of man-made myths or merely reports of historians. They are the revelation of the creator God in whom are all the mysteries, whom are hidden all the mysteries of wisdom and knowledge, written down for us so that we might know him, love him, and commune with him. Those words, these words should be then honored, treasured, obeyed, meditated upon, cherished, when we consider their source. And the fact that apart from a revelation from God, we would be hopeless and helplessly ignorant of our origin, our identity, our purpose, our destiny. Let us then prepare for worship with great anticipation of hearing from God's word.
The Lord calls us to worship from Psalm 27, 1 through 4. Hear now the word of God as he calls us to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies, my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Through war, though war should rise up against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The Lord has called us to worship. Let's respond by standing and singing hymn 370, a hymn of glory, hymn 370. <clears throat> remain standing let's prepare then to confess our faith corporately using the Westminster larger catechism questions 178 185 printed in your bulletin brothers and sisters what is prayer How are we to pray? We are to pray with an awful apprehension of the majesty of God and deep sense of our own unworthiness, necessities, and sins, with a penitent, thankful, and enlarged hearts, with understanding, faith, sincerity, fervency, love, and perseverance, waiting upon Him with humble submission. 
ask you once again to remain standing as we reverence the reading of God's word from Psalm 30. Also, I would ask you to call your attention to the response to the reading. It may not be familiar to you, so have your bulletin handy. Hear now the word of God. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Please be seated. One of the truths that I recently discussed with the men on Tuesday morning is that you cannot tell God's favor on someone by merely looking at their outward circumstances or appearance. Rich or poor, either can be right with God or at odds with him. But regardless of our outward estate, the Lord calls us to worship him through giving, and thus we encourage our members to give 10% out of that with which the Lord has blessed them. And should they desire to give beyond that as an offering, of course the Lord would be pleased to receive that as well. Let us prepare then to give to him. Our Father, we ask now that you forgive those times in which we have not properly given to your work, but pray now that you will bless these tithes and offerings for your kingdom and that you will bless those who give in obedience to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, you have established your throne in the heavens, and it is a throne of glory, high and lifted up. Before you, the angels cover their faces, and it is only because you love us that you protect us from your glory at this time by spreading a cloud over it. Your angels are numbered by the thousands upon thousands, myriads of these heavenly beings surround your throne to do your pleasure. Minute by minute, they shout forth praise and glory and honor as they bow before you in wonder and in awe. And this morning, we join our voices with theirs. We come by faith and hope and holy love into a spiritual communion with that innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all. You are worthy to receive blessing and honor for by your will, all things exist and for your glory, they were created. And so we worship you, creator of heaven and earth, of skies and seas, of creatures of the ocean, land and sky. We pray that you will find our worship a sweet aroma and be pleased with us today through Christ in whom we alone find our righteousness. As, I reflect, as we reflect upon the brilliance of your glory and the wonder of your attributes, we realize that we are of such small account. But for Christ, all we can bring before you is our shame because we are sinners and because we have sinned. Even though we know, may not know anything against ourselves, yet we are not justified by this. But you are the one who judges us, and you are the Lord. Your word teaches us that heaven is your throne, and earth is your footstool, and that the one to whom you look is the one who is humble, who trembles at your word, and has a contrite spirit. You have also instructed us in your word that those who conceal transgressions will not prosper, and that those who forsake them will obtain mercy. And so this morning we bring our sins before you, and we thank you for nailing them to the cross, that they will be remembered no more, and that they will be removed as far as the east is from the west. Sprinkle us with the blood of Christ and purify us of our sin that we might humbly and yet boldly come into your presence with joy, thankfulness in our prayers. We give thanks our morning, this morning for the grace shown to us, for the favor extended to us, for the sacrificial love poured out upon us in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for declaring us righteous in Christ. We thank you for adopting us into your family with the rights to all the privileges of the sons of God. Thank you for sanctifying us by renewing your image in us day by day, by purging us of our sin, and by kindling a fire of desire for and delight in your word and your kingdom. Thank you for the assurance of your love, for, for peace of conscience, for joy in the Holy Spirit, for the increase of grace that we experience every day, for the persevering work of your spirit who will one day bring us home. This morning we bring before you our supplications and our requests. We readily confess our creatureliness and our sinfulness, which so often distort our vision and undermine our wisdom in bringing them before you. We plead then for the work of your Holy Spirit to help us in our weaknesses. We do not even know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we give you thanks for that work of your spirit who takes our meager and ignorant prayers and brings them before the throne. We thank you for condescending to us and accommodating to us such that our prayers can be brought before you and mysteriously incorporated into your divine plan. We pray this morning for the convicting and humbling work of your word. We pray for those who do not know Christ, that they would see him in all his glory and fall before him in grateful acceptance of his sacrifice. We pray that you will humble those who rise up against you in rebellion and hate, and ask that you would change their hearts or thwart their plans and attacks against your people. We pray for those who profess Christ and yet are walking in sin. We ask that you grant them repentance so that they would turn from their sin and return to the shepherd and overseer of their souls and find respite. We pray this morning for the teaching work of your word. We ask that you give us ears to hear, eyes to see, so that we will apply what we learn to our lives and both be a blessing to those around us and a glory to our Lord. We ask that your truth reign in our culture and that the evil one will be exposed for his lies 
manipulation, pollution, and confusion. We pray that you instruct us in holy living, in unencumbered worship and in fervent prayer. Instruct us in righteous parenting and godly employment in our callings, in submissive posture under authorities, and in brotherly kindness. And Father, we also would pray for the encouraging work of your word. We ask that the truth of your word be borne deeply into the hearts of those struggling with dark providences and that they will find hope. We pray for those stricken with afflictions or weighed down by burdens that seem too hard to bear. We pray that they will find solace and refreshment from your letters to us. We ask that you, the, those looking for a calling, those desiring a mate, those yearning for relief for their family and friends in distress will find true consolation and peace through the truths in the pages of your word. We pray in all things that you be glorified, that Jesus be magnified and the spirit be manifested in the lives of your people. In all these requests, we give praise and thanks for your wise and good working out of all things to their proper and good end. And we pray this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. I can ask you to please stand once again for the reading of God's word from the New, New Testament reading, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Once again, hear the word of God. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's continue in our worship by singing together Psalm 28. To you, O Lord, I cry. We'll be singing stanzas one through four. From time to time, we do give Pastor Robbins a break. This is one of those. He's traveling up early to General Assembly, and he is also recovering from eye surgery this week, and I think he would, wouldn't find to preach anyway with one eye, but he's, just, he's, he's actually doing quite well, uh, and that's good. Pastor King is also off serving in, in Roanoke, North Carolina, and so you're down a couple of pastors today. I'm slightly injured. I'll tell you about it later on, but sometimes you just have to play hurt because um, that's what we do. There's a centuries-old debate on the origin of the word religion. I don't know if many of you grew up Baptist like I did, but religion, using the word religion was almost like a curse word. We didn't, I don't have religion, I have relationship was sort of the phrase that, that we use frequently. And so I've always been kind of intrigued by that word religion. What does it mean? How are we supposed to think of it as Christians? Is it okay to use? And there, there is a debate over the actual meaning and origin of the word. There are two potential Latin roots behind it. One is relegare, all ease. 
uh, for the vows there in that word, and it means to observe or to go over again in speech or in thought, sometimes to read or review is the way it could be understood. And the other one is a simpler word, it's religare, and it means simply to bind. I think there's good reasons. I've read articles thinking about both of these being potential options for the right one. I think probably the one that means binding is more appropriate. But when we're trying to think about what religion actually is, one of the ways that you're going to see religion most displayed, in fact, probably what is the most religious thing that a person can do is to pray. When you think about all the religious activities that we engage in, even evaluating sort of what we've done thus far this morning, you might realize that, that only prayer is uniquely religious. Fellowship is common to every society. We're going to, if I will wrap my sermon up in an appropriate amount of time, we will have time for fellowship. Music and singing are not in and of themselves religious. We love to, to gather together and listen to music and sing about lots of things. Reading by itself, even reading the Bible does not have to be religious. There are a number of scholars who spend all day, every day, in the scripture, but do not believe in God. Even sacrifice is a motion that people can go through, that they will give up things in order to get other things. You can combine all of those together, and it can be a well-organized activity, and still it not be religious. Think about college football games, or music concerts, or political campaigns. All of those will, will have all of those different elements, but the one thing that's distinct from them, however idolatrous they may be and how they approach those things, the one thing that they will not do, in most every case, is they will not offer up prayers to that one that they are meeting to glory in. The act of verbally or silently offering up words to an invisible God is a uniquely religious thing to do. Of course, there are pagan religions that will do the same thing, but it is what defines someone as religious. You can be all sorts of things and do all sorts of things, but if you are a prayerless person, you are not religious. There can be circumstances, even in a Christian's life, where he is limited in his ability to fellowship, his ability to sing to God, his ability to read the Bible. But if he is conscious, and even not even all the way conscious, just mostly conscious, a Christian can pray. He can show himself that he, he can show to others and to God that he is devoted to the one above. And so prayer is certainly not the only religious duty, but it is that sine qua non, it is that, that, that without which you are not religious if you do not pray. This is certainly what the Apostle Paul believes, and that's what we will see this morning as we look into this passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 16 through 18 here. We are coming now to the end of this book, getting quickly or quickly approaching the end of it. And Paul has, has gone into a number of different things that he has, he has wanted to point the body of Christ to. And most of those thus far, if you go back to maybe verse 12, uh, even prior to that, he has been concerned with elements of their community together. How are they to live together as the body of Christ? How should they be existing with one another, encouraging each other, and, and, and driving each other to greater obedience? But now in these, these final few verses here, beginning in verse 16, going down to 22, Paul wants to turn his, his attention to things religious, to their devotion to God. And so we'll see this morning. Let's pray together and let's ask the Lord to bless our time even as we consider prayer. Our Lord and our God, we desire to look into these, your words, your spirit has given to us. To make sense of them and to own them. To see ourselves connected to them and to find ourselves obedient to what you ask of us. We pray, Father, that we will carefully give attention not only to these words, but all of your words that considers this topic. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Going back to the beginning of the letter, just to give you some context on 1 Thessalonians, Paul has, has written to a congregation that he had previously ministered to, he had preached the gospel to them, and even in this pagan culture, they had heard the words of truth, they had heard of Christ, and they believed the gospel. They were converted, they were changed, they, give, they gave up their old identity and adopted this new connection to the Lord Jesus Christ, taking upon themselves that name of Christian, someone who is identified as a disciple or as a follower of Christ. And Paul had rejoiced to be with them, to know them, to see their response to it. But he had also wanted to have a report of how they were doing. He had sent Timothy, his beloved brother, to go to them to, to get a report on how things were going. And as, as Timothy came back, the, 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 the report was one that gave him great encouragement. And so Paul has been stirred up by that. He has 
rejoice with them. And he is telling them, in part, how he is continuing to pray for them. Go back to chapter 1. You'll see Paul is very much concerned to pray for this church. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2, Paul writes, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and patience and hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Look over in the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word from which which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. The next chapter, chapter 3, verse 9, Paul writes, For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly, that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. And he continues on in verse 11, offering one of those benedictions, which is, of course, a prayer in verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. Paul is a praying man. He's revealing himself to be a praying man devoted to this congregation and clearly devoted to and entrusting himself in this congregation to God. He is directing them of the life of a believer. And even as he would address all of those things back in chapter 5, leading up to that point of calling them this, directing them towards sexual purity and holiness, directing them towards love, towards work, towards hope in the resurrection, towards watchfulness and sobriety, honoring their leaders and supporting struggling Christians. Now he wants to focus on these commands that, that remind them of what is most fundamental about them, how they are to be oriented toward God. So he begins there in verse 16 in our text for this morning. He says, rejoice always. When he says that Paul is using one of those most common theological words in all of the New Testament, the Greek word behind it is kairo or kara or charis, and it's in that family of words that produces such terms as joy, of course, and rejoice, but also greetings and grace and and favor, and blessing, and thanksgiving. All of those are coming out of this family of words. It, 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 it's a host of words that are connected to and deeply rooted in this concept of this, this favor, this grace that we experience from God. Verse 16, it may not sound like Paul is speaking to the topic of prayer, but I want you to understand that he is. Paul's command to rejoice is a very common phrase. It's one that's, that's used among the Jews as, as a greeting to one another. They use it so often, sometimes it, it could lose its meaning and just be something that you say, like good morning. But here it's obvious that Paul is saying is that he is actually commanding the believers in Thessalonica to be rejoicing or to rejoice continually or always. It is a command. So what is it to rejoice? Well, you can think it means in some way it means to feel glad it means to, to, to feel and, and even moreover to show delight in something. So Paul's command for them in some ways, he's, he's commanding them to experience joy. Okay, now I, don't, I don't know what your experience is with telling other people how they should feel. I've tried that with my wife uh, a few times and said, you don't need to be worried about that. And just very casually, it's, it's no big thing. It's not often appreciated. My, my daughters especially have not welcomed it whenever I told them, you don't need to feel a certain way or you do need to feel a certain way. It's, it's a difficult thing. Bobby McFerrin, 1988, he told us, he tried to make it simple for us. He said, don't worry, be happy. And that was pretty easy to say because it was the Reagan years and things were kind of moving up. They were getting better. But if you remember the lyrics, and I don't know if you need to, but if you do remember the lyrics of that song, don't worry, be happy, he doesn't really get into a lot of motivation for being happy. The closest he gets, and, and tell me if, if you find the flaw in this, the closest he gets to, to giving you a reason not to worry and be happy is because when you worry, your face will frown, and that will bring everybody down. What if everyone else is making you unhappy? Do you really care if they're unhappy too? Not so much. It's not the greatest motivation that you could probably have for being happy. Well, he's making a suggestion, but Paul is not suggesting. Paul is 
commanding. He is commanding to do something that is deeply religious, and it is based on, again, that idea of religion. It's based on the one to whom we are bound. One of the most perfect pictures we have of that command, and you see how it's tied to a someone, is in Matthew 28, verse 9. Go ahead and turn your Bibles back to Matthew 28, 9. We'll recognize this, of course, as being at the end of that gospel. It is after Christ has gone to the cross and also gone to the tomb and after he also has been raised from the dead. And it is that occasion where the two Marys, the, the, the women among the disciples, are going to him after the resurrection. They've, they've come and they found the tomb empty. And then on their way to tell the disciples, we read in Matthew 28, verse 9, it says, As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Think about this scene. Jesus, they, 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 he meets them on the way. And when he sees them, he's the first one to speak. And he gives them this command, rejoice. It's not merely a greeting. Some of your Bibles may have that because they, they've, they've missed that point. But he's, came, he's commanding them to rejoice. And how do they respond? They fall on their faces. They lay hold of his feet and they give worship to the, the one that they were longing to see. To rejoice is to experience something good in yourself. To, to have a feeling that is certainly true, but it is one that is connected very much in such a way to another person that it works its way out. Joy is something that ought to be evident. It ought to be seen. It ought to be displayed. And they are the perfect picture of that falling down in their faces, grabbing hold of Christ and giving him worship. Again, how are happiness and joy Different. They, they are similar. They, they're, they're, they're synonyms in some way. But, but we know there's a biblical understanding of the word joy. And we can distinguish it in this way. Happiness is a response to a moment. It, 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 is, it is a circumstance that gives someone a feeling of elation. And I love being happy. I am very much opposed to being sad if I don't have to be. I will always choose happiness first. But happiness, you understand, is, is, is so short-lived. It's ephemeral. It's one of those things that just comes and it goes. Think about this. You, you go on this date with this wonderful girl and you have the best time. And then somehow you learn that she didn't. <laughs> Party's over. It is not fun anymore. Or you, 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 you've saved and you've scrimped and, and you, you've stored up and you finally bought that glorious, shiny new vehicle that you wanted so much. And you're driving it and all of a sudden you hear this clinking sound that comes from the engine not having fun anymore. Maybe you've gotten your first paycheck and you've opened it up and said, I have a job, I have money, and you open it up and you look and you realize how much the federal government has taken out of that check. <laughs> Happiness is elusive. It, it just wriggles its way away from it. It is so, it's so ready to escape from us. Joy is a feeling of, of, of elation. It is happiness inside, but it is a tethered feeling. It is bound to something. We are to rejoice in God. And this is something Paul is going to tell us to do repeatedly. Just, just listen. You don't have to flip your pages because it's a lie. But j just listen to the way that Paul connects this. Romans 5.1. Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because there's this peace with God because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, that same chapter, he says, Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. He's doubling up in his terms, but Paul says his response is to rejoice in what's been accomplished for him. There's peace between God and man, between him, the chief of sinners, and between a holy God. If we were to pour through the book of Philippians, you would find out it is called the epistle of joy for a reason. Paul is constantly rejoicing in it. Philippians 1.18, Paul says against his, uh, those who would preach Christ for whatever reason, he says, all I care is that Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, and I will rejoice. He's, he's rejoicing, and he says, I'm going to purpose to rejoice that Christ is preached. Chapter 3, verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Chapter 4, verse 10, and I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. And then Paul does it as well in our epistle, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 9. He says, For what thanks can we render to our God for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? 
This is what characterizes Paul. It characterizes his approach to ministry. It characterizes his priorities. Is that there is a joy that goes with him wherever he goes. And he is constantly rejoicing in his connection to God. And that is through the Lord Jesus. So much so that even when Paul suffers, joy is there. Paul actually wants to make this part of his ministry, that what he is constantly proclaiming to the church is how these two things can go together. On the one hand, a believer can be rejoicing. On the other hand, he can also be suffering. Romans 12, 12, Paul says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. He puts those two phrases right next to each other. And then he adds to it, continuing steadfastly in prayer. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, he does the same. He, He says, if one member suffers... All the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You can actually have both things going on at the same time in the body. Again, as I told you, producing a sermon illustration. Yesterday, Grace and I went over to my mother-in-law's house. She's setting up. We're doing a little project over there. And I did the genius move of somehow putting my pocket knife in my pocket and it being open. That's a bad thing to do. I reached in my pocket to pull it out again, and I found it very quickly. Uh, I pulled it out wasn't too too traumatic. I lived. I'm okay. You can see I'm not even wearing a band-aid. But I did have to make 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 some way to to, to deal with that. And so immediately thereafter, I, we finished the project, and Grace and I raced off to Chick Fil A to get milkshakes. Um, <laughs> And I found that you can have both things going on in your members at the same time. One member can be hurting, and another member can be rejoicing. And this is true in the body of Christ. And we've been called upon to actually do this in a number of ways, a number of different times. We have had our our loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord in the same day. We have had a wedding. And we we can hold both at the same time. Believers are actually called to do that, to be able to suffer and to be able to rejoice. Not only to have sadness, but also to experience trial and tribulation. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7. Paul's exchange with Corinth, this is what he wants to say to them. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4, he says, Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort, comfort, and I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulations. Paul says he's joyful in his experience with the apostolic band as they go to the, the, these different cities, as they preach the gospel, and as they, dream, they draw out everyone who hates Jesus in those moments. And it causes consequences. Paul says, I rejoice in those things. When he heard of their seeking out, trying to restore things between the two, he says he rejoiced even more. Why? Because they had suffered. They had been made sorrowful. Paul says in verse 9 of that same chapter, he says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. You were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And in verse 13 he says, Therefore we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. And then he says, Therefore I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. Because they were made sad, because they suffered, even as he had suffered from his trials, they had suffered in the conviction of their sin, and it brought about this reconciliation among them all. And in that he rejoiced. Again, Paul provides this picture over and over. 2 Corinthians 6.10. He describes himself as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. 2 Corinthians 8.2. He says of the Macedonians that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in riches of their liberality. Chapter 13, he says, For we are glad when we are weak, You are strong. He says we are glad. He's saying the same word. We rejoice. Over and over, Paul is going to say, I rejoice in my sufferings. These two things can go together. It is something that is supposed to happen in the life of a Christian. We are to rejoice before our God. We are to display that rejoicing. And that manifests itself most most often and most deliberately when we pray to God, rejoicing before him and what he's done. Philippians 1.3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. We'll go to our second command. We look in verse 17. Paul says there to pray without ceasing. And this is actually a frequent command. The Lord Jesus gave it to us in a parable. He says in Luke 18 that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. 
And then he gives them that parable of the, the persistent widow and the unjust judge and how she prevails upon him and gets what she wants. And he says, this is how you're supposed to pray. Persistently, without ceasing, not being dissuaded from it. Again, we pointed out in Romans 12, 12, Paul says to continue steadfastly in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Colossians 4, 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And again, Paul took his own advice. Paul is constantly praying. You already heard an illustration for the beginning, how he prayed for, for Thessalonica and how he prays for the churches. And that continues on. You see it in the next epistle, 2 Thessalonians 1. He says, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. Romans 1.10, he says, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way, um, the will of God to come to you. He continues to pray. Can I be with you? I want to find a way to minister to you. Colossians 1.3, he says, we're praying always for you. Colossians 1.9, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray. Do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and understanding. One commentator notes on this, he says again and again in Paul's letters, and especially in these two letters that he writes to Thessalonica, the Apostle Paul interjects prayer into his argument. He doesn't just write to them, he writes to them about the prayers he prays for them. He says, for Paul, prayer was as natural as breathing. It's just what he does, and he does it all the time. And so he calls for you to pray. He does that in this epistle. He says in verse 25 of chapter 5, he says, Brethren, pray for us. He believes in prayer. It's not just a platitude. It's not just a way of decorating the language to be convincing rhetorically to his, his congregation. He writes to them, but he is pleading with them to pray for him as well. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, he says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Again, that whole notion of praying without ceasing is one that appears over and over in the scriptures. No, he's not saying that to pray for, for every minute of a 24-hour day. I'm not saying we do that. That would, be, that would be an absolute. He's not saying that, but he's telling you it is something that ought to be frequent. And it involves time where it's spent doing these things that we're called to do, rehearsing God's works in the past, celebrating who God is. And what he's done in rejoicing in that and praying without ceasing about that. To remember his people, to consider them, to bring them to him. It involves praying daily and at different times in the day. And certainly it's not a, a, a sort of a paltry sort of memorized prayer that you repeat before every meal the same one. That's not what Paul has in mind. Paul's not even talking about just having a morning devotion where you say, okay, I've done my praying and that's it. He's saying if you are a believer, you are going to be praying. Your, your day is going to be interspersed with prayer because you are bound to God. You are living a life of dependence upon him and you know that and it pours out of you. Why do we pray without ceasing? Let me give you three reasons. You may need to write these down. Three reasons that we pray without ceasing. Number one reason, because you can you are in a glorious position as royalty. Pastor Dodds prayed it as he prayed for this as the congregation this morning, reminding us of our adoption, that we're in the family of God, that, that, that we are princes as children of God. The preface to the Lord's Prayer, a shorter catechism, asks, what, what is it? What is it about? It says, the preface to the Lord's Prayer, which is our Father which art in heaven, teacheth us to draw near to God with all holy reverence and confidence as children to a father able and ready to help us, and that we should pray with and for others. You are in the family of God. You can pray, act like it. Number two reason why we should pray without ceasing. Because you can. Because prayer is not limited by anything but consciousness. You just have to be awake to pray. You're not limited by time or place or preparation or decoration. None of those things are required. Do you, do you remember the, the story of Esther and how she... she had to go to the king, how she had to make this request of him for her life. Do you remember how she does it? Esther, Esther got decorated up. She, she, she prepared herself and made herself beautiful. She went into the courtyard of the king. She stood across the court on the far back side corner, and she stood there and she waited for him to finally notice her and then call her to come forward. 
And then when she finally was allowed to approach, she comes and bows and she's allowed to touch his staff and then she's allowed to make a request. And so what does she do? She makes a request so that she can make another request so that she can make another request. And among those two, the, the first two requests are the request that she could throw him a feast, that she would provide a splendid dinner for he and who he would like to come. All of this to ask that her life would be spared from the wickedness of Haman. When you come in prayer, you can come in filthy rags. You can come any time, day or night. And you can come boldly approaching the throne of grace. You don't have to sit at the back corner and wait in order to be able to come to God and to ask him to hear you. Number three reason, I bet you can guess what's coming. Why do we pray without ceasing? Because you can. There are so many things that you can't do. You can't change interest rates. You might like to. You can't make someone be your best friend. You can't make it so that you never get hungry. You're not able to do those things, but what you can do is you can pray. You can pray that the Lord will provide your daily bread. You can, play that the, you can pray that the Lord will place kings and those in authority who, who are in places who are wise and make good decisions. You can pray and ask the Lord to grant you peace and prosperity to provide for you all things necessary for life and godliness. And you can do all those things when your mind is steadfast, stayed on him. And this is what Jesus told his disciples to do. Again, back from Luke 11, he says, If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks him for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? Again, Matthew 6, he says, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You can pray without ceasing because it's there for the asking. That brings us to the third thing for which Paul is pointing us to in prayer. He says in verse 18, first portion, he says, In everything give thanks. Again, that word there, thanks, is the same word that's connected, the same root word behind the word rejoicing. It means to give thanks or, or more particularly to express thanks. Again, having a thankful heart doesn't mean a lot, right? If your children never tell you thank you for the good things that you do for them. When you have served mightily at VBS in the past week, as our people have, and no one says thank you, that would be terrible. We did say thank you, but you can thank them again if they were a worker. We want thankfulness to come out, to be expressed, to show up. But it's not, just, it's, not just, it's not just courtesy that we're talking about. What Paul is getting at is a Godward orientation. New Testament scholar David Powell has pointed out that the Apostle Paul mentions the subject of thanksgiving more frequently per page than any other Hellenistic author, pagan or Christian. No one around the centuries that, that Paul is living and writing, in, in their writings, no one comes close to Paul in how much he wants to express thanks. As you pour through the scriptures, I, I, I've spent a lot of time going through this. I can only find one occasion that, that where Paul is, is expressing directly with this term. He, he does so in other ways, but expressly in these terms where he says thank you to someone, and that is to Priscilla and Aquila, and he says that they, they are those who risked their necks for my life. <laughs> they almost got killed because of me in order to make sure I stayed alive. The rest of the time, he is thanking God. Romans 1.8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Romans 7.25, I thank my God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which has been given to you by Christ Jesus. I could go on and on and on. Paul is constantly giving thanks to God the Father and connecting it back to Jesus Christ. So, so what does this look like? If we get what Paul is saying here, what's it going to look like in our, in our life? And what we should have is a picture of a Christian's prayer life according to these verses. This is, as Paul says in verse 18b, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He's saying that, and most commentators agree, that applies to all three of those commands there, is that all of these things are the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. These are what he wants the believer to be doing. 
This is his desire to see man, these traits, these qualities, these practices manifest in his children. That they would rejoice always, that they would pray without ceasing, and they would give thanks to God through Jesus Christ. Paul is hesitant to use that word, but he, he uses it there as the will of God. And he gives us a picture. What, what is that picture? Well, one, if you're, if you're going to get what Paul's saying here, your prayer life is going to be evident. It doesn't have to be evident to everyone else, but it has to be evident to God. He has to hear from you. Luke 11, we read, It came to pass as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. What motivated them to ask the question? It's because they were witnessing the Lord Jesus Christ praying to his Father in heaven. It was seen. And then he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. Believer's Prayer ought to be continual. It ought to be characterized by, by, by a, a, a constant going to God in moments throughout the day. And this is, this is again, this is one of the great tragedies of the time in which we live, is that we do live in an age of distraction. We have never been able to distract ourselves from so many things and by so many things. Hardly a moment goes by in our day if we don't want it to be filled up with some kind of entertaining thing, even if it's educational, that, 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 that dry time, that quiet time, that, that, that dead space that could be occupied with other things is filled up with something else. I'm very appreciative of the anesthetic sometimes that, that, that the entertainment is to boredom and other things. But think how often if you didn't have those things, how often would you say, you know what, this is a good time to pray. And to meditate on the things that the Lord has done. We need Sabbaths. We need times of rest and restraining ourselves from those things that call to us and want to fill up the, the quiet spaces so that we can recognize that quiet time to go to our God and to pray to Him. The prayer life Paul is pointing us to is one which is habitual. It's not only spontaneous, it's not only circumstantial, but it's also deliberate. It's something that you carve out. I mean, there's a beautiful picture of this. We read in Luke chapter 2, when the baby Jesus is, is brought to the temple by his parents, and the, the prophetess Anna is there. And then we, we read this of her. In Luke chapter 2, verse 36, it says, Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. What's the reward for this praying life? Verse 38, it says, In coming in that instance, in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. This praying life was rewarded with meeting Christ. Friends, that is also your praying life. When you persist in prayer, when you have been bound to God in Christ Jesus, when you have been reconciled and had the doors opened up so that you can go and you can pray and fast night and day, you will be rewarded with seeing Christ in heaven. You will witness him bodily. You will rejoice even more than what she rejoiced in that day. It comes when you are habitual in prayer, when you recognize yourself so united. This kind of life that Paul speaks of, this life of prayer, is one which is also sacrificial. It's one that's going to make demands of you. It's going to require you to do things. I don't know how many of you own a beach house, but having a beach house sounds amazing. It sounds like the best. Or even a lake house. It doesn't even have to be all the way to the beach. It could just be a lake house. That would be incredible. But I've actually met people who own beach houses and lake houses, and you find out that they don't live there. It's actually far away and actually takes girding up and loading up and making provisions in order to actually get to that place. And when you get there, there's a lot of different things that you have to do. And there's a lot of maintenance that goes on that requires you to, to upkeep that, to provide for it, to make it so that it is enjoyable when you go there. That you can enjoy that, that peace and, and that time of fellowship. Prayer has got to be at least as important as a beach house. You make provisions for it. It's going to cost you. It's going to make demands of you in order to engage in it. You're going to have to say no to some things. You're going to have to create some time. You're going to have to do some things on a regular basis to create that opportunity for you to go to God in prayer. If you'll take note of the back of our bulletins, you will see that we have a, a number of different opportunities to pray. We remind you of these frequently. 
And Monday morning, ladies' prayer meeting on Zoom. You don't even have to get out of bed. You just have to wake up and be conscious. Friday, 6.30 a.m., men's online prayer meeting. That's two online prayer meetings where you don't have to move. Joseph Brown, I'm told, was in bed for one of those prayer meetings. You can ask him about it. But he was awake and he was there. There's a Sunday pre-service prayer meeting that happens where you can join men outside the sanctuary in the parlor and, and be a part of praying for the service. And then we also have our regular Wednesday prayer meeting. What a glorious time to go to, to a time that's set apart. We feed you so that you come and you get full and fat. Not so much that you fall asleep during the prayer meeting, but just enough to give you energy that you can be a, a participant in that. That time is carved out for you. Then you go and you join in with brothers and sisters who will carry you along in prayer. You will listen to them and learn from them as they pray. It will inform your prayer language. It's a wonderful place to be. And of course, our prayers need to be joyful. They need to be anchored in that joy that comes with being connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, as Christians, we should be a rejoicing people. There's a reason that we can be characterized by rejoicing. Because of what we've received from the Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. He even says of himself as he's preparing to go to the cross, he says, Most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the, the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Why? Because he's going to the cross to be that sacrifice that you require. That you might have fellowship with God. We can rejoice because we, we, we've encountered Christ. Think of, of John the baptizer. Think, think of the Ethiopian eunuch. Think of the Philippian jailer. Every one of them, what happened when they encountered Christ? You go and you look at the text. It says they rejoiced. Your eternity is secured in heaven. Jesus tells us, Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. They are as secure as they could possibly be. Again, you can rejoice because you've been placed in a family. Again, those verses that Paul's pointed out so many times when he says all those things that you're, you're called to be and to do, and in which context he tells you both to, to pray and, he, and to suffer along with and to rejoice with, he says that in the family, the body of Christ. You've been placed here around people who share your joy, and you should experience that joy, and it should overflow from you when you pray. Again, we can never forget why we have a life of prayer. Again, I pointed out before, I hope you heard it in the language, why, what is the reason that we go to God and we, 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 we pray to him? Paul constantly connects it to the Lord Jesus. Again, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing and he concludes in verse 14, in Christ Jesus. The reason you can give thanks in everything is because of Christ. The reason that you can always be joyful is because of Christ. The reason that you can pray without ceasing is always because of Christ. Even now we are preparing to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. You see the table has been set before you. What is that ancient name for this meal that we are about to partake? It's called the Eucharist. Eucharist has that same Greek root in it, charis, for joy. It is the meal of thanksgiving. It ties back to what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. For I received from the Lord Jesus that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, Eucharisteo, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, the assurance that we can pray is bound up with the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks and we rejoice before him because he's made a way that we're invited into the presence of God and our voices are able to be heard and to be answered by our mighty God. Let's pray and seek him again now. Oh Lord, how we thank you for the great privilege of praying to you. Oh Lord, we recognize, we even confess that we take it lightly. We approach you too easily, forgetting the need for Christ. We don't approach you as we should when it has been made so easy through Christ. Oh Lord, forgive us and stir up our hearts. Convict us by this word, by your spirit, and press upon us that we are yours, that we belong to you, and that we can come to you. Oh Lord, make us joyful in our prayers. 
Even now as we approach you and prepare to come to the table, make us joyful in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's now respond to the word and prepare for the sacrament by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnals. We'll turn again to Psalm 28, and we'll sing the remaining stanzas 5 through 8 of To You, O Lord, I Cry, that Psalm 28. Let's stand together and sing. Be seated. Rejoice, pray, and give thanks. A perfect passage and sermon to prepare us for the Lord's Supper. We rejoice in our salvation and all the blessings of the Lord. We pray in humble submission and in joyful communion with Him. And we give thanks for His persevering grace and mercy, His covenant promises, and more, including inviting us to dine with Him this morning. And not just to dine with him, but to spiritually be nourished by him through the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup, representing his body and blood. Who is to partake of this meal this morning? There are several qualifications for those who are to participate. Are there any that are not supposed to? Yes, the answer is yes. And this is what the scriptures teach us. Only those who are able to examine themselves according to God's word are allowed to come to the table. This would exclude children, young children, who do not understand what the sacrament is about. If you're not a member of an evangelical church and in good standing with that church, we ask you not to participate this morning. And finally, if you are living in unrepentant sin, unwilling to acknowledge and confess your sin, we ask you not to participate this morning. This is even for members of Woodruff Road Presbyterian Church. If you are in a place in your life where you are not walking with God, you are not interested in walking with God, if you're living in sin and you're not repenting of it, do not take of the table this morning. We read in 1 Corinthians 11, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we're warned about this. This, of course, does not refer to those who are weak, those who are struggling, those who are perhaps even wondering about, uh, am I saved? And they're struggling with the uh, assurance of their faith. Those who are working against their own sin. These are times, these are the people that the table is for, is to strengthen your faith, to bolster your faith and encourage you in the Lord. And so we invite all of those then who are sincere, informed members of an evangelical church in good standing approved by the Church of Jesus Christ, who love our Lord Jesus in sincerity and truth, we invite to the Lord's table this morning to find ease, refreshing, and strength for your weak and wearied souls. Hear now the words of institution. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed and took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took took the cup also after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father, we come before you now as we prepare to take these common elements, the bread and the cup. We ask that you set them apart, sanctify them according to your institution and your command, that they may be sacramentally, spiritually, the body and blood of the Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name, amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it.
This is my body which is given for you. Take and eat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for inviting us to your table. Thank you for the reminder of the real presence of Christ on this earth, his incarnation, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. On our behalf, the one who reigns above all principalities and power, but who nonetheless is now here spiritually with us, Thank you for this bread that reminds us of his death on our behalf. We ask that you now feed our souls spiritually as we partake. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. After the same manner, our Savior also took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples.
Jesus said to his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood given for you and poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Again, let's pray. Thank you once again, our Father, for the shed blood of Christ, through whom we have the forgiveness of sins. The God-man sacrificed on a cross, diverting the wrath of God from us and onto himself. We pray that the spiritual nourishing which accompanies this meal will invigorate us to live boldly for Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. As we prepare to close the service, I remind you that we take up a diaconal offering while we sing. And so after you stand, you'll have a plate passed around, passed around. And if you'd like to give to those who are in need, we ask that you contribute to that. Let's close by standing and singing hymn number 431, And Can It Be That I Should Gain.
now the Lord's blessing and benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.